The following interview was conducted with Dr. Uh, Rita R. Caldwell, Distinguished Professor, University of Maryland, College Park, and Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January the 13th, 2009 at her office. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in um, Beverly Cove, Massachusetts, in, um, on November 23, 1934. My um, father, Louis Rossi, and my mother, Louise Rossi, um, were immigrants from um, um, Italy. Um, and I was one of um, six children. Um, actually, there were eight, but the oldest died in the influenza epidemic of the um, late um, 19, I said 1918, 1919. And another brother, another, that was a sister, and then a brother died um, just before I was born. So uh, six living brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, went to school in Beverly Cove School for the elementary school years and to Briscoe um, Junior High School and then to Beverly High School and went on to um, Purdue University as an undergraduate. Okay. Can I uh, make a co couple comments about your days in high school or any student activities that you were involved in when yeah. you were in high school? Um, okay. I played on the... Um, girls basketball team and we were pretty good actually good <laughs> and um, I was involved in various activities um, in fact I received an award at graduation for um, writing um, poems and stories and also received um, scholarships uh, to Purdue, which included the um, Daughters of the American Revolution scholarship, which paid for books, and um, other awards for activities as a um, um, pretty active undergraduate, I mean, a pretty active uh, high school student. Uh huh. Good. Um, and had you, did you apply in any other institutions other than Purdue, or how did you happen to choose Purdue? Uh, it's an interesting story. Um, I applied to um, Radcliffe, um, to um, Tufts, and um, I've sort of forgotten some of the other schools, perhaps, perhaps Smith. Um, I was accepted at Radcliffe, which, of course, in those days, women uh, couldn't go to Harvard. Uh, they went to Radcliffe, which means that had I gone, I would have had a Harvard degree. Um, but the and I received a scholarship, but it was only half the tuition. In retrospect, I think the tuition was something like eighteen hundred dollars, which is trivial by today's standards. And I received a nine hundred dollar scholarship, and the other nine hundred dollars were just beyond reach. My sister had graduated. Uh, my next older sister, Yolanda Rossi Fredericks had graduated from the Massachusetts College of Art and then had um, gone on for a master's in fine arts at the University of Illinois. And by this time, she was out of money and had taken a job teaching art at Purdue. And she said, why don't you apply to Purdue, which I did do. And Purdue offered me um, scholarship. So it meant that I could go to college and live in college, at the college, um, and be able to afford it because I received the scholarship um, funding. So it turned out to be one of those wonderful, fortuitous uh, outcomes because had I gone to Radcliffe, I very likely would have ended up um, doing women's studies, um, and that is doing literature or something besides science. By going to Purdue, I was exposed to engineering and to science and found that that's what I really liked. So it turned out to be an extraordinarily good choice and uh, very lucky because it was just a series of 
fortuitous circumstances. Okay. What year did you enter at Purdue? And tell us a little bit about campus life and things when you were here. Well, it was interesting. It was 1952, September, and it um, was really the epitome of the 50s. Uh, Purdue was white bucks, corduroys, corduroy skirts when you were a senior. Sure. Um, and the predominance of the majors of the male students was engineering, and they proudly um, had attached to their belt their slide rules. I don't think any engineering student today knows what a slide rule is. No. Never mind, use it every day. <laughs> um, and I, I joined a sorority, Delta Gamma. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. I was involved in um, a science club and um, the science undergraduate science journal, um, in the debate club. Um, I ended up in the Gold Peppers, uh, Mortarboard, uh, just about all the things that Lots of activities. Yes, lots of fun things sure. to do. Right. Um, um, and even ended up pledge master for my sorority. Oh, very good. Um, what was the, uh, you were in the School of Science, is that, uh, you, you were, that, yeah. that was what your interest was, okay. And what was your major? Well, I started out in chemistry, but the classes were huge because, you know, everybody had to take it. By the way, there were only about 9,000, well, maybe 12,000 students. Okay. At the time, so Purdue was a small school. Of course, now it's what fifty thousand. We have forty thousand here. Forty thousand undergraduates. That's correct. Well, uh, total enrollment at the point at the moment is about forty thousand. Yeah, well, it's a great. Uh huh. Yeah, so it's significantly larger than when I was there. When I was there, um, the entire undergraduate. Well, no, half the undergraduate. Half the, half the total university student population could fit into the music hall. Wow. <laughs> that I gives think. you a good perspective. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I remember that it, there were 6,000 seats, and there, was, there were a few more than Radio City Music Hall because Purdue would boast about that. And then Radio City Music Hall in New York would add a few seats, and then Purdue would add a few seats. I've heard that. It's an interesting story, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Whether it's true, I don't know. But anyway, that was the, uh, sure. the myth. Um, the university at that time, you didn't exactly know everybody, but it was it was a small, a relatively small campus, and it was of course isolated in the sense that uh, the nearest major city was um, Indianapolis uh, in Chicago. So, and Lafayette was not exactly the watering hole of the Western world. But there were sufficient restaurants and, um, of course, the um, Harry's Chocolate Shop was where we all had to go when we could go and have our beer. I think we could still drink beer when you were 16 or 18. I've forgotten. Uh -huh. uh, of course, it moved to 21, and that changed things. But um, the um, student union was where everybody met and um, had coffee and uh, where all of the undergr undergraduate student activities would take place. Sure. I was very impressed uh, as an undergraduate because the music hall schedule was terrific. I saw a production of Aida, the opera, straight from New York City, um, a number of interesting plays and, and uh, very well-known actors and actresses. Purdue made a big effort to have a very varied cultural um, set of opportunities uh, for the undergraduate students. And so the tuition, of course, which I didn't have to pay in the fees, um, gave you tickets to all of the music hall productions. And I went to them all because it was really nice. It was very exciting. And then um, there were the athletics, um, football, basketball. And I was there when Purdue broke the long winning streak of Notre Dame. Ooh, what a milestone. Nice that to be there. Incredible. Yeah, yes. The um, students took down the goalposts and, and uh, carried them to the 
City Hall, Front Steps, and Lafayette. And I remember the parade went on for two days. <laughs> and the um, fraternity uh, houses were really quite funny. One of them, a student was asleep during the game, and they simply picked him up, bed and all, and carried him in the parade. And there he was in his pajamas, sitting in his bed, wondering what was going on, being paraded through the streets of West Lafayette. <laughs> Quite an, quite an event. Indeed, and um, Neil Armstrong's brother um, was also a Phi Gamma Delta, I think, and um, I knew him, and, and um, we dated a little bit. And then I met my husband at Purdue, and we got married before I graduated my senior year, and we've been married happily ever since. What's, was he in the same school as you? No, Jack um, was a graduate student uh, majoring in chemistry, physical chemistry. His brother, Chuck, had graduated with a Ph.D. from Purdue, had been in the program for um, vets. His brother, Chuck, served in the Pacific during the Second War. And Jack was um, a graduate of Mount Union College in Ohio and had been accepted as a Ph.D. student. Um, and was promised, he had been accepted for Navy pilot school, but McBee, the chairman of the chemistry department, said, oh, don't worry, I'll get you deferred, um, come to Purdue and start your graduate program, which Jack did, and within two months was drafted. So he went off to, in the Army, um, to um, the Czech border and served there and then came back to Purdue. So he was a returning vet with the GI Bill, okay. um, and I met him. In, in my senior year, my, I think in the spring semester, and um, we um, decided practically on our first date to get married, and so we made a good decision, I think. Sure. Okay. And we, um, I, we both agreed that since I had done my undergraduate degree there, and I had been accepted to medical school, I had been accepted to several, um, um, to Yale, um, Boston University and Western Reserve, the only ones I applied to. I didn't apply to any others. Um, but we decided to get married, and so I asked the chairman um, if I could do a master's degree, and then Jack would do a master's instead of a Ph.D., and we'd go elsewhere for a Ph.D. simply because it's a good idea to um, do your graduate studies elsewhere simply because it gives you exposure to a wider a variety of, of um, uh, career opportunities and to make a uh, broader community of friends. So I asked the chairman for a fellowship, but <laughs> he said they didn't waste them on women. This was 1956. Uh, times were different, are different now. Mm -hmm. um, but, but my undergraduate advisor, Alan Burdick, was wonderful, Tex Burdick, as he was known. I went to him upset. He said, well, don't, he said that the, the, micro, the uh, microbiology department loss is my gain. He was in genetics. Why don't you, because he was my undergraduate advisor, he knew my record, which was essentially an honor student. So he said, um, I've got a research assistantship. Um, come and do your master's in genetics. So I did. Uh, it was very, very uh, good because I did the master's in genetics, and at that time, there were some very good people, well, they still are, but uh, in genetics, all, Oliver Nelson, who had been elected to the National Academy for developing high lysine corn, and um, Tex Burdick uh, was a tomato and fruit fly geneticist, and so I did my master's on fruit fly genetics, looking at the effect of chemicals on crossing over in Drosophila. Um, I was able to take um, microbial genetics, neurospora genetics, chicken genetics, uh, I think even human genetics, which was incredibly good foundation for going on, as I did, to the University of Washington to do a degree in uh, um, marine microbiology, and now I'm a marine genomicist. So um, it was a, a good 
occurrence all the way through. Very good. Sounds very good. What was your, um, moving on then, after your graduate work, what was your career path before you went to Maryland? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, huh? At the University of Washington, um, uh, Dr. Burdick had recommended that I um, work with a yeast geneticist um, who was in the botany department, but I was really trained as a microbiologist, so I had applied and been accepted to the Department of Microbiology. And the new grad student advisor was um, um, a chap who, it turned out, was not a good friend of the botanist uh, with whom I had been recommended to do my thesis with. So I started out on the wrong foot by suggesting to this one professor in the micro department that I might want to do a thesis in the botany department but stay in micro and that was not exactly the right thing to do because um, I immediately alienated that chap. In any case, a new professor came to the university in the oceanography department uh, school, uh, Dr. John Liston from Scotland and he was a marine microbiologist and I ended up working on my thesis for Dr. Liston in a, an entirely new area, totally new. I was perhaps one, perhaps one of a dozen marine microbiologists. And it was very successful because I was looking at the systematics and ecology of um, bacteria in the marine environment and associated with marine animals. And I used, I wrote the first um, computer program for analyzing taxonomic data in the U.S. There was a group at Iowa who were doing somewhat similar work, but um, my program ended up being the first to really uh, analyze bacteria data. It was the initiator of the idea was Sneath at Leicester University. Well, he was at the British Research Council in London at the time, and then went on to Leicester. Uh, but I was my program was the first, and that sort of gave me some uh, international recognition that very quickly. Um, I applied, as my husband did, to the National Research Council of Canada uh, to do postdoctoral work since one of the um, well-known microbiologists working with bacteria that lived in the sea and required salt was Dr. Norman Gibbons who headed the um, Applied Biology Division of the National Research Council in Ottawa, Canada. Jack and I both got postdocs, but I got another letter that said, oops, uh, because of nepotism rulings, husband and wife cannot each have a fellowship. So uh, I got a letter subsequently from Norm Gibbons saying, I'm terribly sorry about this, but you can come to my lab and have space, lab space, access to the uh, chemical rooms and whatever. Dr. Liston said, well, he said, let's apply for an NSF grant. So we did, we got it. Um, he made me the principal investigator and um, got me appointed, arranged for me to be appointed a research assistant professor in oceanography and um, I was granted a leave of absence, so I went to the National Research Council with an NSF grant. I was able to hire a technician, as it turned out, another woman who, for reasons of nepotism, couldn't get a job. She was um, a PhD microbiologist from University of Wisconsin, and her husband had a job in the Department of Agriculture in Ottawa. So she and I did some splendid work. We, produced a lot of papers, a lot of data, and then I subsequently was recruited because I had become well known in the field of marine microbiology. A friend of mine, Professor Richard Morita, who remains a close friend at the Oregon State University, recommended me when my husband got a job at the National Research, at uh, the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., now known as the National Institutes of Standards and technology, and uh, Dr. Marita, Dick Marita, knew that I was going to have to go to work in Washington. He introduced me at an American Society for Microbiology 
annual meeting, I think it was St. Louis, uh, to Dr. George Chapman, who had just been recruited at Georgetown University to start a graduate program in biology, brand new, brand new building, brand new program. So I was the um, first microbiologist to be recruited to the department for the graduate program. They had a microbiologist who was teaching the undergraduates, but I was recruited in the new graduate program. Um, so that's how I moved um, to the Washington area. And I was at Georgetown for six years and was very successful. Had uh, my NSF grant continued. I got an Office of Naval Research grant. Uh, I had a, um, another NSF grant to study deep sea bacteria and build a deep sea sampler with uh, a team at the National Bureau of Standards. And my group got very large, and um, I was an associate professor. And I was to be promoted to professor, but the chairman, who was a wonderful guy in every other respect, instead promoted that year um, a Jesuit priest who was in the department to a full professor and told me I'd be promoted the next year. Well, I called up the University of Maryland and talked to my friend, Dr. Deutsch, who said, well, funny you should call. We do have a slot. One of our faculty just retired, and we need to hire someone with experience in systematics and ecology. So I um, moved to the University of Maryland as a full professor, and they built me a, a new laboratory. And I had a very successful career at Maryland. I founded the Sea Grant College, working with Dr. Mike Pelzer, who was the author of the most widely used textbook in microbiology for undergraduates at that time, and um, was um, vice president for um, a research, I think, at the university. I um, eventually was um, convinced to become vice president of an entire university for academic affairs, um, and, um, essentially a provost and academic vice president. And then um, worked closely with John Toll, who was the president, and uh, decided in 1982-83 that it was time for Maryland to move into biotechnology because of the opportunities with NIH, FDA, um, the complex of University of Maryland, the medical school in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins, and so forth. So I founded the University of Maryland Biotechnology Institute with um, a new building that went up in Baltimore for the Marine Biotech Center, a new campus now that my building was the first on in Shady Grove, Maryland, which is now the University of Maryland in Shady Grove, and a um, facility at College Park, the Ag Biotech Center. Um, and um, then um, as president of the Biotech Institute uh, in 1998, I was tapped to become the director of the National Science Foundation. Um, and served there for six years, and then returned to the university as a distinguished university professor, and also have an appointment at Johns Hopkins in the School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I, when I left the National Science Foundation, because the term is six years, you don't get a second term, and um, you can serve only up to six years. So I served my full term, um, short a few weeks. Um, and was recruited by Canon, the multi-billion dollar camera company, to help them move into the area of medical diagnostics. And so I helped them found as served as chairman of uh, Canon U.S. Life Sciences, which is now doing very well. And um, recently started my own bioinformatics company, Cosmos ID, uh, which we launched in November 2007. So I keep myself busy. I would say so. What is um, I w one thing I wanted to ask you? You were on the National Science Board at one time, um, and I believe Dr. Baring is is on the National Science Board at the yes. moment. I was um, on the National Science Board 1983 to 19. Um, 
89. Uh -huh. And when I became director, no one from Purdue had ever been on the science board. So I, I tapped Michael Rossman, uh, and he came on the board. And then when his term finished, um, I had talked with um, Steve Baring, and he expressed an interest. And I said, wow, that would be wonderful. So um, he then went on to join the board, and then um, he became chair of the board. Yes. Were you the uh, uh, head of the board when you served on that? When you were on the National Science Board? The Science Board is an advisory board to okay. the NSF director okay. and to the president. So oh. um, I, I was actually director when I tapped the Purdue. I see. Okay. For the board. Yeah. Can you, for the researchers, can you tell just a little bit about uh, some of the things that you were involved in the na with the National Science Foundation, that, uh, just so researchers, uh, some general comments that you'd like to make? Sure. Uh, it was a wonderful tour of duty, so to speak. Um, I was able to complete an agenda that I had in mind when I went there, when I was asked, and then I thought about it. I knew the NSF very well because I had been funded for many, many years uh, by NSF. I had served on Science Education Advisory Committee, the uh, facilities, ship facilities and planning committee, um, re um, panels for the biosciences and the geosciences. I had been very familiar with it. And so when I went to the foundation, I knew there were things I really wanted to see get done. I doubled the stipend for graduate students because it, when I arrived, it was $16,500. Students simply couldn't live on that. So by the time I left, excuse me, by the time I left, the uh, stipend was thirty thousand. I started the uh, GK12 program using graduate students to improve teaching in elementary, middle, and high school. That is, they would get a stipend, one of the fellowships, uh, the equivalent to the graduate fellowships, um, thirty thousand dollars. They would teach. Um, up to 20 hours a week in the elementary, middle, or high school, but and then and, and pursue their degrees uh, in science or engineering or mathematics. And this was a way to bring energetic, enthusiastic young people to help catalyze interest in children. In that program, I started with 12 million dollars that I kind of scrabbled together, and I understand it's now a thriving program of perhaps $60 million. Mm. I um, increased the um, computer science budget. I um, increased it by a billion dollars, $200 million a year for five years. Um, and I started the cyber infrastructure program to make high-end computing accessible to every institution through linkages. I started the biocomplexity program to um, cross disciplines and to get people in the biosciences working with medical scientists, ecologists, geoscientists, chemists, mathematicians, social and behavioral scientists to bring the human dimension into some of these large ecological type studies. I um, also work to improve um, various programs for uh, yeah, advanced program for women to bring them back into the workforce and to um, provide opportunities for them to become established in their research. Um, I doubled the math budget because I think math is so important, and that has resulted in um, a doubling of the number of students majoring in math, according to Science Magazine a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, Quite a few initiatives. Just a few. Yeah, yeah I worked closely with a science advisor, Neil Lane, and then John Mar Marburger, in um, providing, oh, nanotechnology. That was initiated by Neil Lane, but I launched it in a very effective way since he went on to become science advisor, and we worked closely together. And the nanotech initiative, we got that up to about $250, $40 billion, million dollars a year for my time, and it's continued. So it, it was pretty exciting. Yes, it, I would say so. Can we talk a little bit about some of your awards and honors? And I thought the um, one I'd like to start with first is the National Medal of Science Laureate that you received. 
Yes. In um, July of 2007? Yes, um, that was um, really wonderful because the National Medal of Science is given to maybe a dozen uh, people in various sciences, physics, astronomy, chemistry, math, etc. every year. You know, to be one of 12 uh, is really quite a major honor, and it's presented by the president at the White House. Um, which was very exciting. And that was for my work in marine microbiology, especially my work on cholera, which I had shown to be a, an aquatic bacterium naturally occurring in the environment, which was a total paradigm shift. It had been considered only a human pathogen person to person. I also showed that it went into a dormant stage, which is why it was hard to isolate it during between epidemics, because it goes into a dormant state in the environment. And I did a great deal of work showing how you, it was associated with plankton, and if you filtered out plankton, you could reduce the incidence of cholera, which we showed in a three-year study, which NIH funded um, in Bangladesh, in the Mott Lab area, where uh, in old CETO laboratory, it became the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research, Bangladesh, and I did my work there. So that was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And, all, and uh, Purdue honored you with an honorary doctorate. Yes, that, that made me feel very good. I mean, your own institution, your alma mater, uh, and that was early on. That was 19, I think, 83. No, 90, or 93, something like that, maybe? 90, 90, 93. Yeah, something around in that time. But yeah. How, so and how, did they, you, uh, how did you learn about it? Did they send you, a, did someone give you a call or? Yes, um, <laughs> actually, um, I just got a call from Purdue, and and I think one of the one of my colleagues, Al Chiskin, and his wife were probably the culprits, if you will, uh, <laughs> behind it. And and I was very grateful. Uh, it was very nice, and that was really, I think it was be, it was before I went to become an NSF director. So okay, sure. It okay. was nice. Yes, yeah, very good. One of the uh, ones is that uh, Caldwell Massif, the geological site in the Antarctic, that's been uh, that you've got some name recognition there. Yes. Um, For the researchers, just make a couple comments on that. Yes, in uh, 1983, when I uh, was on the science board, I became chair of the Polar Science Committee of the board, and I all the board members get to go to Antarctica to the South Pole Station and the McMurdo Station, and I had wanted to go to Antarctica to do research, and so while I was there, I took advantage to do some experiments and actually published a paper on some of the bacteria there and, and did some more work. And um, I ended up chairing many committees, and I chaired the lab, co the, the committee to replace the bio lab, and we named it after Al Crary, C-R-A-R-Y. But I, I was instrumental in getting the report that um, justified the replacement of what was really rather squalid quarters for the biologists to this wonderful modern laboratory. And then I also was on the um, Norman Augustine chaired a committee, we called it the Augustine Committee, to replace South Pole Station. The building was sinking into the ice and becoming really too crowded and a bit dangerous because of um, being obsolete, obsolete. And so I played a major role in um, both justifying to Congress the South Pole Station and uh, in getting it built while I was director. So um, it was very nice, um, actually before I was director, because of the Crary Lab and the work I'd done in the Antarctic, to be given uh, to, to be given one day a letter that indicated that I had had a mountain named after me in Antarctica. So I was very pleased. Very, uh, very, very, very nice, yes. You were also the uh, first woman member of the Cosmos Club, correct? I was. That yeah. was fun. 1988, I was in, Jack and my husband and I were in um, Australia at the University of Queensland on sabbatical. And I got a, a message to not talk to the press, and I was thinking, why would I want to talk to the press? Well, it turned out, as you know, it was very controversial getting women elected to the Cosmos Club, which until 1988, uh, probably 100 years, had never had women members. And uh, there was great opposition 
Um, and I understand there was opposition to African Americans being elected to the club, and the mayor of Washington, um, who was uh, who said that he was going to take away their liquor license if they didn't vote in African Americans. So <laughs> they voted in African Americans. Um, with with women, um, the vote apparently took place in must have been October 1988, I've forgotten. And uh, a very dear friend of mine had been preparing, along with Johnny Toll, a nomination package, and as soon as the vote occurred, he strode up to the podium, he told me, and slapped onto the desk podium the, my, um, his documentation of my credentials and my, my nomination, so I became the first woman member of the Cosmos Club. <laughs> for the researchers, would you just make a comment uh, for, uh, when they hear this on the tape? The Cosmos Club is a, where, just a little, what, what type of club it is? Um, it yeah. was um, founded um, by um, a group of scientists. It was uh, Powell, I think, has the auditorium named after him. It's a, it's a club that's not just a dinner and lunch uh, place to stay club in, in Washington, D.C. It's known for its lecture series. It's a meeting place for dis uh, discourse, um, law, science, the humanities, the social sciences, politics, government. And so it's very exclusive. Um, I think it has about 1,000 members at any given time, maybe 1,600. Um, and until 1988, no women were allowed, in fact, once when I was at Georgetown sharing the seminar department, my guest was a famous protozoologist from Indiana University. And the 1789 restaurant just off the campus, uh, named 1789 because that's the founding of Georgetown University, uh, was closed or overbooked or something. So the chairman uh, said, well, why don't we just go to the Cosmos Club? I'm a member. So I said, sure. So we made the arrangements. And when I got to the, we got to the Cosmos Club, and I was with the rest at the front door, they said, oh, women have to go out in the side door. So I had to go around the back and up the back stairs because women weren't allowed on the second floor in the uh, special banquet rooms for meetings like the seminar, you know, the guests mm -hmm. for the seminar speaker were in the upstairs rooms. So that was not exactly <laughs> a nice thing, but... When I later received the Cosmos Club Award for my work and so forth, I reminded the club that I had once had to go in the back door or the side door and was now pleased to be able to go at will in and out of the front door. Right, as, as the need arises, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. A uh, couple of professional associations. One I did want to make a, um, ask you a little bit. American Institute of Biological Sciences, you've served as president. Yes, mm -hmm. I actually um, served as president of the American Society for Microbiology in the mid-80s, and then subsequently president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Mm -hmm. And I've also served as president of the International Union of Microbiological Societies, which meets overseas every year, occasionally in the U.S. And then this past year, I was asked to be president, I was elected president of the American Institute of Biological Sciences, which encompasses all of biology. Um, uh, the um, botanical, zoological, microbiological, behavioral uh, bio biology. So it's been been quite nice. Right, exactly. Let's talk about family. Is your uh, what? A, your husband is he still um, affiliated? And, yeah, Jack is a physicist, and he's um, uh, um, semi-retired, and he's uh, a senior scientist at at NIST. Uh huh. And. Um, yeah. Uh, he's been very, very supportive. He works he works in low-temperature physics and uh, spent his entire career, professional career, at the Bureau of Standards, or in the sure. Standards in Technology. Uh -huh. um, I have two daughters. We have two daughters. Uh, one is the um, botanist at Yosemite National Park. She works for the National Park Service. And the other is a physician. She has an MD and a PhD. She did her... MD, PhD at the University of Illinois in the Medical Scholars Program and did her thesis work in Tanzania on uh, Moshi and Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro. 
and then went to Dartmouth, well, went to Harvard as a postdoc, Harvard School of Public Health, and then did her residency and uh, fellowship training in pediatrics at Dartmouth, and now runs a clinic um, in Windsor, Vermont, uh, that I think is still affiliated with Dartmouth. And uh, she has three children, uh, so I have grandchildren now. Well, that, that I, makes nice for the holidays. It sure does. We, right. A little boy who's 10, named after um, uh, my husband Jack. He's known as Little Jack. He's not so little anymore. And a little girl who's six, Adelaide Kate. Um, and um, a four-year-old um, whose name is Fenton Finney. Um, and my daughter's married to a writer, Rick Canning, Richard Canning, known as Rick. Um, and he's terrific. He writes at home, does editing, and um, the two of them raise the kids together. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, did either of them, your children, come to Purdue? Um, they've only come on occasions uh, okay. when the honorary degree came up. My daughter Allison um, came. She was, um, and Stacy, both of them came to Purdue on that occasion. Sure. And um, let's see, any other occasion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let's talk how about a favorite Purdue tradition. You have one of those that you'd like to share with us? Well, um, I always get a kick out of the, the roar of the lions. Uh, I think that was, if you were an undergraduate, and, and uh, the shrine of the virgins, I guess, when you walk <laughs> past the lions, it's, which probably aren't there anymore, they were supposed to roar. Um, I think... Um, Probably the just the fun times, uh, being known as a boilermaker, um, and um, just the undergraduate. Well, the traditions I think of going to the union, uh, going to the chocolate shop, um, the um, the football games, the traditional parties after that, um, the traditions in the sorority. Uh, it was just a, a very nice undergraduate experience. Right. Very nice. Right. Okay. Do you have an outstanding event in your life? Yeah, getting married at Purdue. Very good. I was married by um, the chairman of the philosophy department in a tiny little um, church just outside of Lafayette. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, how uh, do you recall the levy or the uh, village has changed a lot since you were here? You, cause oh you, yeah, you've been back and forth. To, you've been to campus. Uh, yeah, I've come back a couple of times as um, just as a um, uh, what's it called the alumni, uh, the uh, distinguished alum. Right. Um, old masters program. Sure. I've right. come. To, I've been invited back. I think twice as an old master. Um, and the most recent, I think it was a couple of years ago, when I've, I've given lectures. Um, yeah, it, it's changed. I mean, it's the, the library is, is so modernized, and um, the, um, um, the mall, the engineering building is modernized. I mean, it's just incredible. The, I think just about all the, quote, temporary, unquote, huts are gone where art used to be, t art teaching was done. And, and um, some of the uh, temporary buildings around the physics department. Um, and I think um, there was Avalon Hall burned down, didn't it? Oh, a number of years ago. But yeah. they, they have, the, yeah, sometime w before I came, but the, they've got the new Hovland Hall is there. And of course, where they we were talking about the temporaries, that's where the Armstrong uh, Orange of Engineering is located right. there at Stadium and, and uh, Northwestern. Yeah, what's interesting, though, and what's nice is that the um, accommodations, the hotel and the student union has not changed. Mm -hmm. And the student union really interior has not changed. It's still the kind of hallowed, shadowy hall uh, with um, photographs and the memorabilia. And the rooms look pretty much the same, and that's kind of nice. Yes, I would agree. Uh, in uh, in closing, are any some comments that you'd like to share with us, or any questions that uh, were not asked that you'd like to make some general comments on, Doctor? Well, I, I, one of the oh, things well. that I feel about Purdue is that it, it's sort of like uh, Diogenes with its candle under a bushel basket. It's a wonderful institution. It has served the nation 
certainly in space research and, uh, and you know providing I don't know how many astronauts now um, it it has provided extraordinary undergraduate education but it's not as widely known as it should be it should be the name that comes to anyone's mind when they think of a um, university, a United States uh, university, a particularly a state university, um, it should be right there at the very top because that's, in my, in my perspective and opinion, that's what it is. It is. It's great. And I, I, I thank you very much. Any, any closing comments? Uh, that Anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm just very grateful for the education and for the friends. I keep up with my um, undergraduate friends, particularly my sorority class. We get together periodically, and we've aged well. <laughs> As a group, we're, we're still together, right? Exactly. Right. I want to thank you, Dr. Caldwell. This has been most of, I'm very much appreciative of you taking the time to uh, for this interview, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank